a standard physics question. Uh, it actually has to do with being inside of a planet and how that relates. So the first thing I would like to do is I'd like to do not a rigorous proof, but something that will be logical enough that you can follow it. And I would like to talk about, let's imagine that we have uh, a shell. Okay, so let's say that this right here is a, is a shell of a sphere. Okay, it's 3D, it's a hollow sphere. And let's take just a point here inside the sphere. Some point doesn't matter where. And just to make this easier, I'm gonna bisect it. And as we can see, these two angles are the same, and I'm actually gonna do this as well. Okay? And would we agree that down here, if you were looking at it just projected on the far side, there's gonna be some mass down there. And there's gonna be some mass here. We're gonna call this mass M, and we're gonna call this mass big M. <coughs> We'd agree that we have an angle here, theta, and this angle up here will still be theta. This distance to the edge, let's call it y, and we'll call this distance here, which is the radius of the sphere, let's call it x. Sorry, I'm gonna make that a little bit clearer. We're gonna make that big y because it's on the bottom, and big x. We all good on that? And this one up here, this distance here, will be little y, and this distance here will be little x. We all good so far? Let's find the gravitational field at this point. Due to those two, those two on either side. So first things first. G equals, and since it's a vector, we're going to add them all together. It would be G up minus G down. Or the pull of that gravity and the pull of this gravity. We agree with that. Well, let's put in our equations what we know. G up equals big G, the little mass, over R squared. And now instead of R, we're calling it little y squared. Minus big G, big M, over big Y squared. Now, in order to relate these masses, We've been talking before about lambda, which was a line density. Well, now we're gonna use sigma. And sigma is defined as kilograms per meter squared. It's an area density, which equals the total mass divided by the total area. And just as we did before, talking about a line density, if you were to have a shell of metal and you were to take a piece of it and the whole thing, they have the same densities. So then it would also equal little m over little a. Or the big area, little area. Okay? We all good on this so far, right? Well, let's define those. Our little area up here, area is always pi r squared, yes? But see on my r, this radius here is going to be little x. So this would be pi little x squared, and this will be pi big x squared. We're all good so far. Let's plug all this stuff in. So my total gravitational field, my net field, will equal big G, little m, oh, and let's look what m, little m equals. See there's sigma? So m equals sigma times my little area. And what's my little area? that. So little m equals sigma pi x squared. And down here, big M equals sigma times my big area. So, so right there. And my big area is this. Let's plug all that junk in. So now I get little m, which is sigma pi x squared over little y squared minus big G sigma pi big x squared over big y squared. Now looking at this expression. This is x and this is y. Let me draw this out here so that's very easy to see. This is the radius from here to here. We don't even need that. This is y, this is x, and this is theta. And this is opposite over adjacent, which equals tangent. 
which also equals little x over little y. So what is x squared over y squared equal? Tangent of theta squared. G sigma the, uh, pi tangent squared theta minus big G sigma pi. Oh, and big X squared over little big Y squared is still tangent of theta. And what do we notice? The net gravitational force at that point is zero. This mass may be closer to point P, but there's less of it. This mass is bigger, but it's farther away. It turns out, now, if we were to take this logic and we were to go all the way around it, and if we were to use calc this where it was a, a better derivation of this, this is a kind of faking it, but it gives you enough for you to believe it. Everything on this side, the closer stuff, would be balanced by stuff on the other side. So it turns out when you're inside a hollow shell, there's no gravitational field. And the best thing we have in, that I can show you, and it's not about gravitational field, and Katie, can you see that? Is that right there? Okay, so if I take this, and since it's a dry enough day, hopefully it will. I'm putting charge on this metal, metal cylinder here. And you'll notice, I'm gonna do this here for the camera first, you'll notice that they're moving out on the outside, but not on the inside. So that, there, in this case, we're showing electric field. There's no electric field inside of a closed uh, conductor. But in this case, with what we just proved with logic, is that there's no gravitational field inside of a hollow shell. Now, if that's true, that there's no gravitational field inside of a hollow shell, we can all accept that as a fact now, right? Now, let's imagine, and this is the, the problem that will be on the test, and it is uh, a common problem in physics books and in college, so let's make sure we know how to do it. If we imagine that we have a large planet, okay, that's the best circle I've got. And let's imagine that we dig down into the planet, and we make a really, really large hole into the planet. Would you agree that if we got to this point right here, that there's still part of the planet underneath me. And then there's the planet outside me as well. And the planet that's outside, those would be made up of shells. Imagine you're at a space station. That's not a moon, it's a space station. If you go down one level into the moon, the level above you would have no gravity on you. You go down to the next level, the two levels above you would have no gravity. So as I'm going down deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the planet, all of these shells, on the outside would have no bearing on me. So it actually turns out, and the e &M kids are about to do that. what? So G equals big G mass enclosed over R squared, which sure looks a whole lot like Gauss's law. And by the way, if we actually follow this to its conclusion, if we were to take this, and we'll say, what, what if that was a different constant? And we were to say uh, gravitational field times area, which would be 4 pi times some constant. This actually would give us Gauss's law. There would be our dA, which would equal the mass enclosed divided by some constant. I don't know what that gravitational constant is. We'll just call it a C. Okay? And actually, Gauss did this as well. Now, for those of you that are not in E&M, you can forget all of that. For those of you that are in E&M going, Whoa, it all fits. Yes, it does. <laughs> so let's go back to this. And what we need to find now, well, first of all, if you would agree that as we get closer and closer to the planet, there's less mass below us. So what we have to do, and this is the only part of this that's actually a little bit complicated, is we have to find out how much mass is below you. So here's the actual setup. So this is R, the big R of the planet. But let's say that we're inside the planet at some distance inside, and we'll call that little r, where r is less than r. 
Well, we've got to find the mass enclosed. Well, we know that the whole thing, this is M, R, and Rho, which means it's a uniform planet. That means every little chunk of the planet is the same as another chunk of the planet. If I were to come up and go and take a little bit, it would have a density, and the whole thing has the same density. There's more of it, but it has the same, because it's made up of the same material. Well, density is mass divided by volume, which would be the total mass divided by the total volume, or equals the mass enclosed divided by the volume enclosed. <coughs> So if I wanted the mass enclosed would equal rho a constant times the volume enclosed, which would be 4 thirds pi little r cubed, because that's how far I am from the center of the planet. We're all good so far? I'm going to plug all this junk in. I get equals big G, my mass enclosed which is rho four thirds pi little r cubed over r squared. And we notice that two of the r's cancel. So we get that g equals four thirds g rho pi, it's a lot of junk, times r. Now, it's time to play something fun. It's time to play constant or not constant. <sighs> OK, constant or not constant? Constant. 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 Constant, 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 not constant. I could rewrite this entire thing as this. Some big constant times r. How would I graph that? It's just linear. Okay, I'm going to draw this twice, actually, we'll understand here in a bit. So it's going to go from here, and it's just going to go straight up. And they could ask you, do we know big G? Yes. If they, uh, we know pi. We know four thirds, at least I know four thirds. Anyway, um, you could find the density of the planet, couldn't you, from that slope? Or if you knew the material it was made out of, it's made out of silicate or something. They say this much mass, or sorry, this much volume has this much mass. You could calculate rho. You graph this. Couldn't I find the gravitational constant from that? Now, that's not the way Cavendish did it, which would be phenomenally difficult, not to mention we don't have a planet like that, but what the heck, you know, we're, we're physicists, we're just going to come up with, we're physics students and teachers, we're just going to come up with crazy stuff. Let's move on. Let's take this, however, and I want to put rho back in. And rho, we have down here, equals total mass divided by total volume. So let's plug that in. G equals four thirds, big G, my total mass divided by my total volume. Big R cubed, pi R. What do you see about those four thirds? They cancel out. And the pi is canceled, very sad. I hate it when pi is gone. Big G, right? Okay. Um, big G M over R cubed times little r. Once again, constant. Constant, constant, even though it's a different constant, it's still linear. Now again, this right here, let's just be very, very clear. Let me see if I can find a different color here. Uh, I wish I had a blue. I do not have, oh, there it is. So here would be four, R is less than big R. Another way of saying that is inside the planet. But what if we said R is equal to R? We keep going out. It keeps increasing because the, 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 the mass underneath you keeps increasing. And then all of a sudden we get to the edge of the planet and little r equals big R. And so now I have G equals big G, my total mass over R squared, which is just the gravitational field due to a planet, and this is for r equals r. But what about if I'm outside the planet, which means all of a sudden I am out here, and r is bigger than r. Isn't all of the mass still enclosed? So now g would equal big G, big M over little r squared, 
for r is greater than r. Now, it's, so right here, would you agree that as r gets bigger, g is getting bigger? Because you've got more mass underneath you. There's the maximum gravity you're going to have. <coughs> and now it's going to start decreasing as you get farther and farther away from the planet. Which would look like, there's my maximum right here. That would be big G M over R squared. And then it would decrease as a 1 over R squared. Now, people on the internet are going to see that and go, oh, it's wrong, it's wrong. I know it's wrong. I'm getting there. Just troll later. Okay? When I get to this point, we remember, though, that this would be the magnitude of G. But remember how R points outward and the acceleration due to gravity points inward. Because our actual gravity equation, if we include the vectors, is that G as a vector equals negative G big M over R squared R hat. So that, 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 graph isn't, that graph is correct for the magnitude only. But if I want the actual graph, it looks like this. If this is R and this is G, starts at the origin, at a distance r from the planet, at the surface, it goes to a maximum point, which is negative big G, big M over r squared, linearly. At which point it will start to decrease out of a 1 over r squared. And I usually do this just to make sure I get all the points. Now that we've calculated how to find the gravitational field inside of a planet, now let's talk conceptually about what would happen. Let's imagine we take a mass m and we're just going to drop it. Well, as it goes down, each time it goes down here, there would be less and less gravity on it because as we proved earlier, the gravity is only due to the mass enclosed, the mass below it. The shells outside have no, you have no gravity when you're inside of a shell. So if we just look at this just easily, we'll say that we have a shell here and we have a shell here, okay? When you're, when you're at this point, all of the shells below are giving you gravity. When you're right here, well, only the shells below you again have gravity, etc. When you get down to this point, let's call it the center of the planet, at this point, the gravity would equal zero. Here, if it were the Earth, gravity would equal 10 meters per second squared, or sorry, the acceleration due to gravity. And as you go down, it would change with the radius. It would get less and less and less and less. And as we proved that it was equal to some constant times r, in other words, half the r would be half the gravity. If we're halfway down, then this would be 5 meters per second squared. Just because the gravity is decreasing doesn't mean it's slowing down. It's still being pulled down. It's just being pulled less and less and less. You have an object moving. You push really, really hard. It's going to accelerate. I push more lightly. It's going to keep accelerating. And when it gets to the very center of the planet, if it continued, it would keep moving, not because it has a force pulling on it, but because it has inertia. And we know that objects in motion stay in motion unless acted on by an unbalanced force. And at that point, the force would be zero. Think about a pendulum. Let's call this L, it's attached to the ceiling, and here's your mass, M. At this point in its swing, at the very bottom, it would have mg down, it would have t up. Let's say it's going this direction. But at this point, there's no x forces. All the forces are vertical, but it keeps moving. No one has ever seen a pendulum do this and stop at the bottom. That doesn't make any sense. We know that it will keep moving up because it has kinetic energy. Therefore, it'll turn to potential energy. It has momentum because it has both m and v, and that momentum will help, help allow it to move up until gravity slows it down again. Same thing if you had a, uh, an object going down a curved track. Here, the, grab, the force down, down the track would be uh, mg sine theta. Here, the force, mg sine theta again, would be less. And at this very point right here, sure there's Fn, and there's mg. Fn is bigger because it's in a circular, circular path. But at this point right here, there's nothing pushing it, sorry, there's nothing pushing it this direction. It's coasting. It's, uh, it's just moving because of its inertia, because of its momentum. But all the way from here to here, it's still accelerating, just not as much. Its rate of acceleration 
is decreasing, but it's still accelerating. So that would be V equals zero, if we assume that's as high as it goes. And here we would say V equals max, and V equals zero again. Slow, speeds up, slows down. Speeds up, slows down. Likewise here, it's gonna speed up all the way to the center of the planet as kinetic energy, or sorry, as its potential energy at the top turns to kinetic energy at the bottom.